Hello friends, welcome to SNW Audio YouTube channel. Today, we have the first video of the SNW VFA01 project video series. In this video series, I will be teaching you the basics of audio amplifier design, and I will be designing with you a best-in-class hi-fi audio amplifier. The purpose of this video series is to provide a crash course on audio power amplifier design, while also demonstrating the design of a best-in-class audio power amplifier. All the sections covered in the video series will be covered over the span of two videos or two-part videos. The first part video will always be a theory video where I'll be covered circuit design concepts, and the second part of the video will be a hands-on video where we'll be designing together each piece of the audio amplifier. The target audience for these videos are both beginners trying to learn how to design audio amplifiers and veterans who might want to learn new design ideas or new tricks. The ideas in these videos will be a combination of my ideas and experience with the ideas presented in the books by Bob Cordell and Douglas Self. Therefore, I am building on top of established knowledge. Before we dive into the contents of today's video, I want to introduce myself. My name is Sandro and I am an electrical engineer and a circuit designer. I went to school at MIT, where I graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in 2003 and a Master's of Engineering in 2005. While at school, I actually designed my first power amplifier back in 2001 when I was in analog lab class. The circuit actually is right here. I'll talk about it more a little bit in the next slide. But the most interesting thing was when I was in the class, the instructor introduced me to Douglas Elf's book which I put the uh, little picture of it here. And you might not recognize the cover because this is the second edition. And that's, that shows you when that this was a while ago. But uh, I actually read this book cover to cover and I was pretty hooked on on the topic and it's become a side hobby for me. Well, I did my master's of engineering. I was trained by Professor Robert, who is one of the pioneers in feedback in circuits. After graduating, I joined Analog Devices and I stayed with them from 2005 to 2016. While I was there, I designed mostly op amps and amplifier related products. I was in the linear group. I listed here the part numbers in case you're interested to look them up on the web. The part I'm actually the most proud of is the AD4932, was the, my first solo project. While I was at Analog, I was mentored by Scott Worser and Moshe Gerstenhaver. Uh, most of you probably know Scott. He's a well-known persona in the audio community and the designer of the AD797. So here's the schematic of the first power amplifier I designed. This was designed on my junior year in college in fall 2001 when I was in analog lab. The performance of this amplifier is not bad. The total harmonic distortion plus noise of, into 8 ohms at full power is about 003% at 1 kilohertz and 0.06% at 20 kilohertz. I actually measured it with an audio precision. But looking at it now, the amplifier has lots of areas of improvement. Just to give you some examples, uh, the resistors here, the degeneration resistors of the current mirror, should actually be larger than the degeneration resistors of the differential pair for noise reasons. We'll look into this when I discuss about noise. The transistor of the second stage, the GM transistor, should not be a signal transistor like a 2551. It should be actually a, a medium current handling transistor. In the testing of this amplifier, actually this transistor kept blowing up on me. The BBE generator here, the B-bias generator, should not be done with diodes. It should be done with a BBE multiplier. And the transistor should actually be mounted on the heatsink. In this case, it's diodes weren't. So the thermals of this arrangement of this output stage weren't particularly good. There are many more issues in addition to the ones just described. These include not enough output pairs, underrated pre-drivers, no supply filtering, etc. But even though this amplifier had many problems, it was a good first project given my level of knowledge at the time. More so, it got me hooked on audio amplifier design. As of right now, I've planned for the first seven videos of the series, which should take us all the way from the introduction of the project 
to the design of the input stage. If you look at the titles, you can tell that the first six videos are mostly conceptual and foundational videos. And after video seven, or on video seven and onwards, we'll be doing the hardcore design. Today's video is mostly an introductory video. For the theory part, we'll discuss audio amplifier specifications, as well as the goals for the design project. And on the practical side, we'll talk about uh, how to do simulation without this device, or at least an introduction. All right, so let's jump into the content of the video. So section one, we'll talk about audio amplifier basics. Let's start from the beginning, and that is, what is the role of the audio power amplifier? In my opinion, the role of a hi-fi power amplifier is to amplify line signals and drive them into a speaker. It is not to add color, effects, or new sounds to the input signal. As a result, I find the typical question of how does your amplifier sound to be a question with no answer. Why? Because an amplifier does not have sound. Actually, I think the better question to ask is how well does your amplifier reproduce sound, which implicitly is asking you how low distortion and how low noise is your amplifier. We'll talk more about distortion and noise in a little bit. Input signals to the amplifier are line level signals with typical amplitudes of one volt RMS. The signal source should behave like a voltage source with low output impedance. The expected load of the amplifier is a loudspeaker. The output voltage typically ranges between 20 volts and 60 volts RMS depending on the amplifier power rating. For example, for 8 ohm loads, 50 watts translates to 20 volts RMS and 400 watts translates to 60 volts RMS. For 2 ohm loads, at the same power levels, the swings will be halved. Given these voltage levels, the amplifier's gain typically ranges between 20 and 40. Again, this depends on power rating and may be higher for higher power amplifiers. My industry experience is in the design of op-amps, but in my opinion, op-amps are very similar to audio amplifiers. Audio amplifiers are larger and more powerful versions of an op-amp. As a result, a lot of the op-amp design techniques can be transferred and reused in the design of audio power amplifiers. Now, let's discuss audio power amplifier specifications. Level setting on these early on will allow us to set the goals for the design of the SNW VFA01 amplifier. The four most common specifications are rated output power, frequency response, noise, and distortion. The first specification relates to how much your amplifier can actually deliver, while the latter three refer to how well it can deliver. The rated output power, which is measured in watts, tells you what is the maximum energy per second that your power amplifier can deliver. In layman terms, higher rated output power translates to a louder power amplifier. While rated output power is not a difficult specification to conceptualize, there are many dependencies on this specification. These include the voltage of the power supplies, the size of the heatsink, the number of output transistors that the amplifier will have, the ratings of the transistors used, etc. Therefore, once you pick your output power, you're also making a lot of implicit trade-offs right from the get-go. Frequency response, which is measured in hertz, is the input frequency band that the amplifier can process. Essentially, it is the minus 3 dB bandwidth of the amplifier, both at the low end and the high end. The frequency response of the amplifier must expand at least the hearing band, which is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz but typically high-end amplifiers go a decade beyond and below this frequency range. Actually, nowadays there's a recent trend for amplifiers to be even higher and higher speeds, where upper bandwidths of 500 kilohertz to one and a half megahertz are not uncommon. The reason for this trend, and this will become apparent in later videos, is that faster amplifiers can actually deal better with distortion artifacts. The next specification is noise, which is broken down into two sub-specifications. Voltage noise referred to input, which is measured in either microvolts RMS for total noise or nanovolts per root hertz for spectral noise, and signal-to-noise ratio or SNR, which is measured in dB. Total voltage noise referred to input is the equivalent voltage noise generated by the amplifier 
when it is integrated into a single input source. Think of this noise as a voltage source that sits in series with the amplifier's input terminal. The difference between total voltage noise and a spectral noise is that the former accounts for the bandwidth of the amplifier, while the latter does not. In my opinion, total voltage noise is better to quantify the amplifier's performance, while spectral noise is more useful during the design of the amplifier. The reason voltage noise is referred to the input is to make the specification independent of gain. SNR is the ratio of the amplifier's input signal amplitude in volts RMS to the amplifier's total voltage noise, also in volts RMS. You can see the formula right here. SNR can be calculated when the amplifier is running at full power or when it is running at 1 watt. Outside of audio, SNR is typically measured with full input swings, therefore that's the way I prefer to do it. Also, it makes the calculation easier because in that case, V input RMS will be 1 volt RMS. SNR can also be weighted or unweighted. This has to do with how the total voltage noise is measured, where a weighting function is used to account for the human hearing sensitivity. I actually prefer to measure unweighted SNR, again, because it's much easier to do. Finally, we have distortion, which is measured in total harmonic distortion, or THD, and total harmonic distortion plus noise, THD plus N. THD is the percent of output signal which is due to harmonics generated by the amplifier at a given frequency tone and output power. I am stressing this piece because distortion will change quite a bit depending on the frequency at which you measure it and at which power the amplifier is running at. Here is the formula for THD. In this formula, V2, V3, V4 is the amplitude of the harmonics, and V1 is the amplitude of the fundamental voltage. THD plus N is very similar to THD, with the exception that noise is also included in the calculation. More specifically, the amplitude of noise is included in the numerator of the formula. And the reason THD plus N is more popular than THD actually when reporting distortion is because when you actually do the measurement, noise will be present and it will be part of the output that you see from your test equipment. So it's very really difficult to separate the two when actually measuring the amplifier. Therefore, most manufacturers will typically quote THD plus N rather than THD. Other amplifier specifications include damping factor, DC offset, dynamic headroom, power supply rejection ratio, a slew rate, maximum output current, and minimum output load. I'm going to go over these specifications relatively fast because I think they are actually straightforward. Damping factor, which is reported as a number or is essentially a unitless metric, is the ratio of the amplifier load to the amplifier output impedance. In modern solid state amplifiers, this metric is not very relevant since the output impedance of the amplifier is very low. In the next video, where we will be measuring a real amplifier, you will see that the metric is actually dominated by the impedance of the solo network. DC offset, which is measured in millivolts, is the amplifier output voltage when no input signal is applied. DC offset is important because actually large offsets can damage your loudspeakers. Dynamic headroom, which is reported in dB or percent, is the ratio of the maximum continuous output signal to the maximum burst output signal that the amplifier can support. This metric essentially qualifies how good your power supply is by showing how well the power supply can deal with current bursts. Power supply rejection ratio, which is reported in dB, is the signal gain from the power amplifier rails to the amplifier output. Essentially what it's doing is measuring the ability of the amplifier in rejecting power supply ripple. The slew rate, which is measured in volts per microsecond, is the maximum rate of change the amplifier output can have, and it measures how well the amplifier can respond to high frequency content. There is a big debate on how much slew rate your amplifier actually should have to achieve good distortion. In my experience, what I've noticed is that while low slew rate will give you high distortion levels, high slew rate does not guarantee you low distortion. Therefore, when we cover input stages, we will do an experiment to show how much slew rate do you actually need. Maximum output current measured in amps is the maximum output current the amplifier can safely deliver. In a properly designed amplifier, 
the maximum current will be determined by the trigger points of the current limiting circuit. Finally, minimum output load, which is measured in ohms, is the minimum impedance load the amplifier can drive. These next two are not actually amplifier specifications, but in my opinion are actually must-haves. The first one is safety. When you're building an audio amplifier, you're going to be dealing with very large currents and voltages, and these currents and voltages can actually kill you. To give you an example, think of a 150 watt amplifier. The voltage rails will be plus minus 60 volts, so if your body impedance is about one kilo ohm, if you actually touch both rails, you're going to be experiencing a current of about 100 milliamps. 100 milliamps means death, so please be careful. The second one is reliability. If you think about it, you don't want to be fixing your amplifier all the time. You want to build your amplifier to last. How do you achieve this? By choosing components that are reliable and by putting protection in your amplifier. Actually, if you remember the story about the first amplifier that I built, there was a transistor that kept blowing up over and over again because it was underrated for the stresses that it was going to experience. In that regard, that amplifier actually failed. It was not a reliable amplifier. Now, let's talk about what is not an amplifier specification. Some descriptors, including qualitative adjectives like leaner, more controlled, more natural, more articulated, enhanced, richer sound, do not carry meaningful information about the amplifier and should not be used as a specification for the amplifier. Why? For three reasons. First, terms like these do not translate to electrical performance. For example, how does more control sound translate to THD? Second, they do not have consistent meaning. Two people will interpret these adjectives in different ways, and this will lead to confusion. And lastly, they don't even have units, so they cannot be quantified. And if they cannot be quantified, how can you actually compare two amplifiers using these terms? As a result, my recommendation is to actually use the specifications that we just talked about in the previous slides rather than sound descriptors. Now that we have talked about all these specifications, I would like to show a commercial example. Here we have the specification page of a Macintosh MC152 150 watt stereo amplifier that retails for about $5,000. Power rating for this amplifier is specified to be at least 150 watts for all loads across the hearing band. Total harmonic distortion, 0.005% for all power levels across the frequency band. My guess is that given that they are quoting a single number, this rating must be for 20 kHz of full power output. At lower powers and lower frequencies, THC will actually be better. Dynamic headroom, 2 dB or 26%, is quite acceptable. Minus 3 dB frequency response, 10 Hz to 100 kHz. Given the distortion performance of this amplifier, I would have expected that this amplifier was going to be faster. My guess is that they're filtering the bandwidth to optimize for noise. Input sensitivity, 1.2 volts unbalanced, 2.4 volts balanced. The unbalanced spec, which is more translatable to what we'll be doing in our own project, is a little bit higher than the typical 1 volt RMS, but not by much. Signal to noise ratio, 93 dB unbalanced, 115 dB below rated output. I'm not sure what below rated output actually means, but my guess is that the former number is for 1 watt and the latter is for full power output, given the 22 dB delta between the two numbers. By the way, 22 dB delta is the ratio of the output voltage swing at 150 watts versus 1 watt. Damping factor greater than 40, okay. Input impedance 22 kilo ohms. This is somewhat higher than the typical 10K, but it's nothing crazy. Voltage gain. Changes with load in order to keep the max power output constant. I'm not sure how this works though. I wonder if you have to actually go change a setting depending on the load or does the amplifier actually does it by itself? Uh, not sure. If you guys know, actually let me know. In any case, these are the specs of the MC152. And this is what $5,000 actually buys you. Now, let's discuss the project goals for the SMW BFA01. The SMW BFA01 will be the first of a series of amplifier designs. The goal of this project is to design the ultimate voltage feedback audio amplifier. 
targeting specifications are on the next slide. Looking ahead, future designs will also include entry-level amplifiers, fully differential amplifiers, and current feedback amplifiers. In the following table, I am summarizing the performance goals for the SNW BFA01 and comparing them with the specifications of the MC152 and the DIY Audio Honey Badger amplifier. The Honey Badger will be a reference amplifier for performance. In my opinion, it is the best DIY amplifier out there, although I have to admit, I have not looked at yet at the new BC1 amplifier from Bob Cordell. If you look closely at the specifications, the Honey Badger actually beats the MC152, and I am sure you can build it for a lot less than the MC152's price tag. We will look in more detail at the Honey Badger in the next video when we're doing LT Spy simulations. Now, let's look at the specs for the SNW BFA01. Power 150 watts to stay consistent with the reference amps. Also, this is a good power output for most home use applications. Frequency response, same in the lower limit as the Honey Badger, faster in the upper limit to optimize for distortion. Noise, 110 dB of SNR and 3.3 nanovolts per root hertz of spectral density. This spec will actually be quite a challenge since I just heard Bob Cordell saying that there are no amplifiers who have broken the 5 nanovolts per root hertz mark. Distortion, I'm going to try to break the 0.001% or 10 ppm mark at 20 kHz at full power. System offset less than 1 millivolt, PSR greater than 100 dB. Slew rate, I'm marking it TBD for now. It will have to be whatever it needs to be to achieve the distortion targets. Finally, for current limit, currently I'm putting 10 amps of current limit, but this may change as we design the protection circuit. So there it is guys, the challenge has been set. We'll see how we do in the future videos. Now, let's jump into what comes in our next video. The next video will be a hands-on simulation demonstration using LT Spice. As you can see on the left, that is the current setup that I'm using to do simulations. And in the next video, I'll actually walk you through it, discuss the best practice that I'm using in this setup. We will perform simulations as part of a demonstration. And at the end, I will discuss future improvements that we can do to this setup. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video. And if you like the content of this video, be sure to subscribe. That way you will get notified when the next video gets posted. See you next time. Goodbye.